Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're just um, waiting for everybody to join the webinar. So maybe just a minute or so, get everybody in, and then we'll start. So thank you for coming today. It's a little bit crowded at the doors. Everybody has to come through a little uh, bottleneck in order to get into the webinar. So we'll just give it a few more seconds to let the rest of the people into the room and then we'll begin. Okay, I think that's, uh, I think that's as many as we're, we're gonna get today. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, hosted by Cheshire Wildlife Trust and today we are going to be talking about ponds. My name is Martin Varley and before lockdown I was Director of Operations at Cheshire Wildlife Trust but now I have been promoted to webinar host. This is my, this is my new job and with me is Jan Schoen. She is our resident uh, pond doctor. Uh, for many years Jan ran the education program and has probably done more pond dipping than I have had hot dinners. And we're looking forward to sharing her experiences of ponds. So good afternoon, Jan. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> we, have, we did try and do this webinar in the garden, but we've heard it might rain. So we both moved into the house at, at short notice. So anyway, um, so gardens, they're, they're great places for wildlife, particularly now that so many of us are trapped in our own homes. But they're also very important. Um, all, if you put together all the gardens in the UK, you'd find they would cover an area the size of uh, twice the size of Cheshire. This afternoon we want to explore uh, garden ponds, see some of their key features and look at why they're good for wildlife. Now most of you have passed the first test which is actually getting on to Zoom. Um, it's something that many of us were not familiar with a few, few months ago and now we're becoming experts at it. So first of all I want to give you some, some, some tips about Zoom. Um, firstly neither me nor Jan can see see you or hear you so it's fine if you're sitting in your front room in your pajamas um, and as we go through the, uh, the, the webinar you can ask questions so if you look at the bottom of your screens you will see a little button which is marked Q&A and um, if you click on that button you can just start typing into the, the, the square and you can type questions in there. So as we go through the, the talk, if there's something that we say that you're, you want to know more about or you want to have some information, just start typing in that, into that box. Um, we are recording this webinar, so if you, if you have friends who want to listen to it or you want to listen to it again, it'll be available at the end. So we should also say that um, by, by being here, you've given us consent to, 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 to uh, have you on this webinar, although obviously we can't, we can't see you, so there's no, there's no risk. Um, and just for the format of the webinar, is for the first bit, Jan and I will talk a little bit about ponds. Um, we've got a couple of videos and a, a short presentation. Then we've got some um, questions and, and photographs that um, participants have sent in. And then at the end, we will try and answer any other questions that have been posed to the questions and answer button at the bottom of the page. So that's sort of the, the schedule. And hopefully we will finish by about quarter to three, unless there are so many questions, we stay here all day. <clears throat> So um, I think that's probably the end of the preamble. Just remember, this is, this is actually the first webinar we've tried as a wildlife trust. So um, we're gonna be switching between videos and presentations. So please bear with this, because it could be a bit of a, a white knuckle ride. We're all, we're all learning in this new world. So let's, uh, let's start then, Jan. Um, we've talked about ponds. We wanna talk about um, um, how important they are for wildlife. And I just wonder if you can tell us something about why ponds are so important. Yes, um, so a wildlife friendly garden, it's a really nice feature to have a pond in, in a garden that's wildlife friendly. Um, for lots of reasons really, um, they attract a, a lot of wildlife and some of which are predators to some of our garden pests, such as slugs, so it can be a good way of organically controlling pests. Um, so, um, so I'll put the presentation up for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. 
So I've put together some pictures of the sorts of creatures that we might find in a garden pond. Um, I, this isn't the first slide, Martin. Can I have the first slide? Thank. No, keep the other way. Try that again. <laughs> so first of all, I thought about the creatures that you might see around the pond, um, and some of the ones that live sort of on on the edges or amphibians that will use the area around the pond and area the area in the pond. Let, hold on, Jan. Let's just try and get this. Um... <laughs> It's PowerPoint right. Okay. Okay, so this is the, the oh, we've gone back to my hand again. <laughs> right. That... Okay. Let's just take take it. Can you take it from there, Jan? Yeah, okay. Uh, you've moved you moved again. So in and around the pond you you'll get some um, birds coming to bathe, to drink. Um, you could get amphibians coming in and out of the pond. Obviously, the amphibians use the pond to lay their eggs in. So, smooth newts, great crested newts, even common toad, frogs, um, and then dragonflies that lay their eggs in the water. So they, they, they tend to patrol the, above the pond during the hot days looking for insects to eat. Um, and the interesting one there is a grass snake in the pond. I don't think many of us have got grass snakes in our ponds, but who knows? It's a, it's a really fascinating picture, that one. Um, so if I can move on to the next slide, Martin. Yeah. I was then thinking about uh, the creatures that live in the pond. Um, many of them are actually insects. Uh, so we've got lesser water boatmen, greater water boatmen, all sorts of different diving beetles. They're insects that can fly from pond to pond. So they live in the water most of the time, but if they need to move, they can, which is quite handy if a pond dries up. Uh, you get um, tadpoles, of course, you might get newt larvae, uh, dragonfly larvae, and then other larvae of um, big water beetles. And if we move on to the next slide, we've got a lot of larvae on this slide. Um, uh, so there's uh, non-biting midge larvae and the phantom midge larvae in the middle there. That's a very strange see-through sort of creature. Um, so what we're seeing here, uh, a life cycle of an insect being uh, played out in the pond. The in, many insects lay their eggs in water and their larvae spend sometimes up to five years with dragonflies, you know, quite a lot of time in the pond, more time probably in the pond than they will do as an adult flying around above the pond. Um, and then other microscopic creatures such as water mites, uh, water fleas, cyclops, freshwater shrimp. Um, so we, the next slide, if we could just have that, Martin. Um, it's just a, a slide of a of pond food web. Um, and I think I put that in because I just wanted to show you how uh, creatures are interdependent on each other. And in order to have a healthy pond, you need to have as much of that food web in place as possible. Um, and we'll talk a bit later about some pe people's problems with ponds um, and how to encourage them to have a good food chain like that and be a really good pond. Uh, but first we've got um, a, a little film um, my daughter and I went pond dipping a few days ago um, and this is Kerry, my daughter, showing you what we found. Okay, Jan, let's put that up now. Hello and welcome to Bickley Hall Farm, the headquarters of Cheshire Wildlife Trust. Today I've been dipping in one of their educational ponds to show you the sorts of creatures that you might be able to find in your garden pond. We're just going to have a look in this tray here to see what I've got today. Right in the middle here we have a case caddis fly larvae. Now you can't actually see any of the creature because he or she is inside this case that they, it's built out of detritus and vegetation in the pond. This acts as a protection against predators, almost like a shell. Speaking of shells, we have over here a ram's horn snail shell. This is quite an old one, it's got a little bit of damage on it but you can see where it gets its name from. We also have over here, I'll just move them into the middle, a pond snail. This is quite a small one, it's got a lot of growing to do yet but it's got a conical shape to its shell. And then over here, I'll just agitate them a little bit, we have a tadpole, the quintessential tadpole over there. And then we have a diving beetle, which is very active, swimming around the edge of the tray over here. We also have a diving beetle larvae at the other side of the tray over here. Now this is what the adolescent form of that creature looks like. 
There are many different species of beetle in a pond. As you can see by this tray, you'll see a lot of movement of small little black dots. There are many different species of beetle and water boatmen that are buzzing around in the tray today. We also have some damselfly larvae. We have a number of them here. As you can see, they're swimming around. And we also have some mayfly larvae, if I can find one for you. They seem to quite like being at the edge of the tray. There's one just there, much smaller than the damselfly larvae, but of a similar shape and there is a number of them over here. So that's an example of the sorts of creatures that you might be able to find in your garden pond. Okay, Jan, that was great to see some of the things that we can see in ponds. Now, um, obviously they're hidden under the water. I mean, is it easy for people to just go and look in a pond and find some insects? I mean, can, do we need to have special equipment or anything? Um, well, not really. I mean, you can you, you could use a pond net, obviously, if you had one. Um, and you, you do need something to put water in um, so that you can put your creatures that you catch into into some water once you've caught them. Um, and it helps if it's quite a pale colour. So something like a washing up bowl would be as good as anything. Um, if you haven't got a pond net, then you could try just tying a sieve to a, a long stick and using that to see what you could fish out. Uh, so you could just run the um, sieve or the net through the water maybe concentrate around the edges where um, there are places for little creatures to hide because that's where they're more likely to be um, and just dip a few times and see what what comes out. And what about ID identifying them? Some of these creatures have got really long Latin names. Is there a, somewhere where we can go to see if we can see what they're called? Yeah, well they do they do all have Latin names but most of them also have names like you know common frog or um, water boatman so you know there's, there's, there's other names that are easy to remember. Um, there's lots of guides and books out there. I mean, when I, you mentioned that I've done a lot of pond dipping with children in the past. We've always used the Field Studies Council guides because they're really easy to open up and just have on the table next to you or on the floor next to you. Um, and you can, you can match the creatures to the pictures on the guide. Okay, that's, that's, that's really good to know. So it's easy to find out what some of these are called just by looking on the internet or getting a simple guide. So if we've looked at some of the wildlife in ponds. So what can we do to make sure that we've got a pond which is uh, creative or sufficient or has enough difference or is designed so that it's good for wildlife? Is there, is there, are there good things or bad things to make in a pond, different features we need? Yes, definitely. Um, I've got a picture of a, a pond that if you could just pop it on the screen, that'd be great, Martin, um, of a pond that has good features for wildlife. Um, just wait for that for a second. Next slide. No, no, it's that. Is that it? Uh, oh, that's my pond. But I don't think that's the one I want. Uh, go backwards. Okay. I'm not sure we can go backwards. Okay. Oh, All right. Let's try this again. How about that? Um, I can't, oh yeah, there we go, that's the one. So that's a, a, a lovely wildlife friendly pond. Um, so it has different depths of water throughout. So there's areas at the front there where it's shallow and like a little stony beach so that creatures that like warmer water or creatures that want to go in and out to drink or bathe such as birds can get in and out easily without getting stuck. Um, areas of uh, cover around it so that when when something like a snake or a newt is coming towards the pond, it, it's not open and exposed and, and uh, predators can't necessarily see it very well. So that's a good feature around a pond. Um, the rocks just create a bit of diversity. Uh, a lot of plants um, um, which produce oxygen in the water. So plant, there's different sorts of plants you can get. There are plants that you plant in marginal areas, plants that you plant in shallow water and then medium and, and also ones that sit at the bottom a very deep pond. So there's all sorts of different ones. And as you can see, that one's got a nice variety. Um, and the plants that stick out of the water, they're excellent for dragonfly larvae and damselfly larvae. As the larvae turn into the adult form, they crawl out onto those plants, cling onto them and then um, pull themselves out of their, their old skin, which we call exuvia. Um, so no, there's certainly you don't really want, you don't really want overhanging trees and branches with leaves that will fall in because that Cause problems with the pond being coming over nutritious if they rot down. 
Um, they, it is good though there to have shade for a pond as well as a bit of sun, a bit of a mixture because uh, too much light can cause too, too much oxygenation going on and um, that can be a problem in a pond. Um, so lots of native wildlife um, plant species which we've got lists we can send out to you later. Um, so oh yes, the other thing I was going to say was that uh, plants that stick out of the water with, with floppy leaves are good for newts to lay their eggs on. They like to wrap their eggs up in um, little bits of leaf when they lay them. Um, it protects them from predators and that's really good for newts. So if you want newts, something like water forget-me-not actually is quite good for that. I've got that in my pond. So those are some good features. Anything else, Martin, you can think of? I know you've got a film coming up, haven't you? Your oh, let's see. Let's see. Um, let's see what that looks like uh, in the real life. Yeah, I, I have made a pond in our garden in the last couple of years. I'm, I wouldn't consider myself to be a pond expert. So this is what you can do when you know very little about ponds. So we'll just we'll put this one up, and we can have a look at what a pond looks like in in a garden. Hello, I'm Martin Valley. I work for Cheshire Wildlife Trust and I'm here today to show you my pond. We're talking ponds. So here's the pond. Um, we just wanted to show it to you because there's different ways that you can make a pond. So when we started with this garden, it was all just grass. There was no, no definition to it at all. And I thought, I want to dig a pond. So I basically did a little bit of Googling and I found out that you can make it different shapes, different depths. And what I wanted to do was to make it as uh, diverse as possible so as many things could, could live in it as possible. So if you look at the shape of it, top end, it's kind of narrow. Uh, there's a narrow bit in the middle and then at the bottom it widens out. <clears throat> so that allows uh, more wildlife uh, to live in each of the little niches that you find. If you look around the edge, you can also see that some parts are shallow and easy to get into for, for some animals. Some parts have made rocky, so there's no consistency around the edge. I've tried to get it as diverse as possible um, with little nooks and crannies so that frogs and insects can, can survive in there. So if we start at this end, um, we've, we've got a sort of uh, shingle beach up here, some uh, low-lying plants growing in here. Um, and then shelves as well. We've got some shelves across here, just different, just different spaces for different animals. And this is about, this here, it's about what's that? That's about six inches deep. So that's not very deep at all. I've buried the depth as we come along. Um, and then in the middle here, we've got a, a bog bean, which is nicely flowering this time of year. And also we've got some interesting little features that the family have put in. So one of my kids has put in a lighthouse. Uh, it's looking a bit worse for wear now. There's been a few storms against there. Um, we've got a sort of rock pile here that uh, we've collected off the beach. The dog's taken the top stones on there. We should be a bit bigger, but it's kind of a place that we all like to come to and we all enjoy sitting next to. So if we move down to the bottom end, this is the wider end. We've got a, a bigger bay of water for, and it's deeper in the middle here. If we put my stick in the middle, it goes down to uh, maybe a couple of feet there. I've got a, a water lily growing in here. And I bought these plants off the internet. They're, they were all British um, wild wildflowers, but we tried to get as much British stuff as possible. This is uh, oxygenating plants in here, keeping the water nice and clear. Um, we haven't got any fish, but we've got lots of snails. We've got lots of uh, dragonfly nymphs. And then it was finally here. We've got a, a sort of large kind of boggy area with these um, these these tall plants here. They allow the dragonfly nymphs to come up and. Um, uh, turn into dragonflies off here. You'll sometimes see the exuvia on here. So we've got plenty of these tall plants for dragonflies. We've got plants that come out at different times of year. So the marsh marigolds are here. They've just they've just gone over. And then as we go around, kind of these tall. We've got some yellow flag in here. We've got some mint. Just some of these I've transplanted across. So I've just allowed to spread tall plants that mixture of plants and vegetation, so that the, the insects, the aquatic invertebrates that are in there, are are able to uh, to spread out and come ashore so it's just just quite a diverse thing it's not cost a lot of money stones we got off free cycle um, and you can do it quite cheaply just give a little bit of diversity to your garden we haven't got the, the biggest of garden um, it's, in a, it's in an estate so here is quite an organic uh, busy sort of space and lots of diversity and lots of interesting spaces for, for wildlife to go so you can do this in your own garden I dug this myself I was a bit tired but um, it's kind of working pretty well for us a couple of years old and it's just beginning to settle in now so up to you hello I'm Martin Val
Okay, so I hope that showed you some of the things that you can put in your pond in real life. And Jan, I thought it looked very similar to your picture, actually. It was almost as if you'd copied your picture off my pond. My picture? You know, your, your illustration in the PowerPoint, it was almost as if you'd taken it from... Oh, you mean, you, you, yes, I should just have used a photograph of your pond. Yes, it was a very, very thorough, that very good, very good film. So, it, so that's easy enough if, uh, you know, if we've got a nice garden where we can put a pond in, but I mean, is there, a, is there a size of garden? Is there something about the space that we need or can we just make a pond anywhere? Um, well, nearly, nearly anywhere. Obviously not absolutely anywhere, but um, I've got a few pictures of some different, some much smaller ponds. So a few perhaps without as much space as Martin and I have got. Um, then you might consider making a pond. That's, that's actually my pond. Uh, I put that in because I just thought I'd like to, so I did. And um, <laughs> I wanted a bit of more of a formal pond. Um, uh, because it's in a front garden, but we also wanted it to be good for wildlife. So we've kind of given it a hard edge, but apart from that, it's got a lot, it's only been there a year, so it's not very well established, but it's doing well. It's had dragonflies in it already. It's got newts in it. So if we could have the next picture, Martin. Yeah. Um, so this is um, an illustration of really how to build a small pond, but just to illustrate that basically all that's been used here is a bucket. So if you've got enough room to put something that small in that you can dig, dig into the ground, then yes, you can make a pond. Um, now, it's got some of the features that I said were good for wildlife that we mentioned earlier that you showed us, Martin, on your film. Um, really importantly, it has some plants which keep the water clear. And uh, also really importantly, it has a, a sort of a level where you buy the, the animals can climb in and out so uh, things don't get stuck. So that's a, an important thing. Um, and the next picture was of a sort of a square vessel. It could almost be something like a large box or an old sink or something like that. So again, it's got the features that, um, some of the features that we discussed have been good, the plants and the, the ease, easy access in and out. And then I put some photographs into the next two slides. Um, these are obviously items that you may have around or that you can easily get hold of. Um, and again, they are displaying those, those same features which are really important. So if you have something that's raised off the ground, like these two are, um, put it against a wall or something, you know, as you can see with the first picture, things can climb out easily. Um, and the next slide, please, Martin. Um, and just another couple of examples of ways you could make a very, very small pond. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we don't, we don't, we don't necessarily need a large area or have a big garden. We can, we can make ponds um, in many different places then, can't we? Yes, and they're a nice project if you've got children to help you know, them help you do it as well. So, and that's actually an excellent thing to be keeping an eye on every day and seeing what comes to them. Very entertaining, really. Well, we like to go out every day and see which plant has flowered or whether we've got any little insects crawling around or whether there's a bird. I sometimes get a pigeon that comes and sits in it, which, you know, I, is, is, I'm like, get out of my pond, you pigeon. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's a space for all sorts of wildlife, isn't it? Yes, yeah. We've got, some, uh, we've got some questions and answers coming through. And now um, with the rest of the, the webinar, we'd like to look at some of these questions. So we've got some coming through on the chat. If you want to put some more on there, just click on the Q&A button and, and add your question into it. But we've also had some sent through before with some pictures of people's ponds. So we're just going to look at those questions now and uh, see if there's any common themes or some themes that we can help people with in their ponds. So I'll just put that up. Uh, first of all, we had, uh, we had this sent through from, from Anne. It was just uh, she wanted to sh show what she was able to do in her garden. It's, uh, it's got a waterfall and a, an amazing sort of linear pond going through there. So, so that's pretty impressive, isn't it, Jan? Yes, it is very impressive. Um, I, I, I can't quite work out whether it's on a slope, but I think it may be a little bit. That would certainly help the flow of the water, wouldn't it? But it would be very nice to have that running through your garden. Very nice. Yeah, and it shows what you can do, if, even if you don't have very much space, you can still make something which is quite, quite, quite impressive. Yes, yes, indeed, yes. Okay, so Colin has sent through um, this pond, and what, uh, what Colin has said is that um, he's got this standard preformed pond, but as you can see, it, um, it is, it's very cloudy and it's, uh, there aren't any, any plants in it, and he was just uh, wondering what he should do um, to, to deal with this sort of green algae that he's got in it. Yeah. Uh, well, this is a very common problem, and I think it, it does, it's been cropping up quite a bit, hasn't it, with the questions of ponds either going into a 
sort of a green soup or having green algae in them or having the duckweed on the top of them, that kind of thing. Um, this is caused because there's too much nutrient in the actual pond um, and also by excess amount of sunlight. So the best thing to do with a, with a pond like this is to address the issues it has um, by making sure there are more plants in the water for oxygenation um, and encouraging a diverse wildlife um, a species to come because you want as, the, as that plant weed as that weed rots down it causes detritus in the water so you need things in the pond that will eat that detritus and you need plants that will use the nutrients that are being produced so you've got to, you, what you're really developing is a really good food chain cycle of of nutrients being being um, um, you know, moved around the food chain um, and then eventually hopefully the green stuff would disappear. Now there are treatments you can get for it but they only really treat the cause not the, the sorry the symptom not the cause um, so there are organic chemicals you can use which will reduce it enormously and actually that would help if you want to get plants growing in there because they've struggled to compete with that at the moment um, so it might be worth looking at yeah, go on. Sorry, Martin. So it's not so it's not beyond beyond redemption. Then you think this pond just is no, no. I think what I would do with it is probably find an organic treatment and try that, and also try physically removing that stuff. Um, we use a pond net to remove ours. You can twiddle around with a stick, and there's all sorts of ways you can do it. But uh, I think I try to get it out as much as possible, and then try and increase the biodiversity in the pond. Okay. Well, I think we might, there might be some few some other questions about oxygenation later on. So we'll move on to um, next. The next uh, picture of a garden, which I, I find quite interesting here, this is Rachel. She says, we moved into this um, new build house in July and the garden is a blank canvas. We want a pond and it's, not, it's a north facing garden and they, she'd like some advice as to where to situate it. And the second thing is what's the best material to use when she's constructing the pond? Is it pond liner or dig a hole wash or is it these preformed liners that, that would be better? What do you think, Jan? Well, first of all, we could talk about where to put it. Um, I think, I don't know what, when you put your pond where you did, Martin, whether you thought about, about this, but a pond needs a bit of shade, um, not full sun, really. Um, so I noticed that you put yours close to the house, Martin. Maybe that was because there was some shade there that you were thinking to take advantage of. Um, um, but I, I think it was, it was just, I didn't really want to move very far from the house with ours. Our, our garden yeah. was, in fact, very similar to Rachel's. It was, it was a, just a piece of, a, a plain piece of grass and it was like a blank canvas, really. So we were able to, 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 to do what we like and be creative as you like. So Rachel's got a really good opportunity here to make something really nice. Yes, and I think um, if you've got aspirations for the rest of the garden as well, think about the whole garden uh, when you're deciding where to put the pond, because moving a pond is not a good idea. <laughs> We've done that. We put it in the wrong place to start with when we moved into this house and we decided too close to a hedge and you know so we we, ha we did move it in the end but it was a bit bit of a problem really. So where would you put it on here then Rachel? Which which dog would you put it next to? Is it two dogs? I've got two dogs. questions. For me. <laughs> I have to get rid of them. I think they're the same dog Martin. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, whereabouts would you put the pond then Jan? Um in that partly shaded area, I think, a partly shaded area that gets a bit of both, somewhat maybe fairly in the middle to one side, perhaps. Like I say, it does depend on what the plan for the whole garden is. Do think about that because okay. you know, you've got some trees there, they don't want the leaves falling into the pond. Um, so okay. think about them growing bigger as well. And, and, what, and what, what's your, what, have you got a, a preference for how you should make it, whether it's this pond line um, or the preform liners? I, I mean, we've, we've always used um, pond liners. They're very flexible. Um, we tend to put um, a layer of something softer, like an old carpet first. I don't know did, whether you did this, Martin, but the pond liner um, becoming, with getting a hole in it is a, is a problem because your pond obviously drains. So yeah. if you can protect the liner before you put it in by putting an old carpet down, um, that's a good idea. Did you do that, Martin, or did you just use a pond liner? Well, uh, we, li we're, we live in Crewe, which is quite, quite clay. And by the time I dug down, I was at the clay layer, and I, I decided just to put the pond liner on top of the clay and thought that would be all right. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the, the hard ones. The, I don't know what they're called, the formed plastic. Preformed pond. liners. I think they'd just be more difficult to get the, get them in, you get the shape because you're digging them, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah. I, I, I think the easiest way is to use a liner and protect it if you've got stony soil. Okay, okay, we'll move on to uh, to Mike's pond now. Mike says, 
Um, he lives on he lives on the Wirral, and he's installed this pond just over a year ago, and it's filled with rainwater. And he says he's found four or five new inhabitants that look like. Here's what I found on the web. It looks like um, it looks like a, a stonefly, um, stonefly larvae, and he wonders um, it, would that is that likely, or would it be something else? Um, it, it, it could. It sounded more to me when I read the description. I've got it in front of me now. It could be a mayfly larvae, to be honest. Um, but it could be a stonefly larvae. Without actually seeing it, I, I wouldn't know for sure. Um, I think it's probably more likely to be a mayfly larvae. Or it might even be a damselfly larvae. I guess it's easy to say there's a lot of insects that could be um, moving into ponds, couldn't there? So like, like, uh, like Kerry was showing us, there's plenty of different types of insects which we could find in there. Uh, yes, like I say, because they're insects and they move from pond to pond, they are able to choose which pond they lay their eggs in. Um, and you do get a, a, a lot of different ones, a lot of different ones. And a lot of them do look very similar as well, actually. They've got the three tails and, you know, they, they, you, you have to get your eye in with them, really, and have an ID thing next to you. It is maybe worth saying that if you have got something in your pond and you're not sure how to identify it, there is, a, there is an app on your phone you can get, which is called iNaturalist which you can just take a photo of that, that uh, species, send it off into the internet, and then some expert in the internet will get back to you with what it is. So it's possible, even if you don't know how to identify it yourself, you can, you can maybe get some solutions on the internet. So we'll move on to, to Tim's pond now. He sent in a, an amazing pond that he's got in his back garden, which is, a, certainly I'm envious of having a pond like that, but, but he says it used to have um, a lot of fishing over the last few years of roach and rudd and carp, but for the last two years, he's had nothing, and he, he wondered whether we had any ideas as to why the fish might have gone from his pond. Yes, um, I was a bit puzzled by that, because it looks to me like a really healthy piece of water. It looks like, like almost like a lake, not a pond. It's fantastic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, um, so I could, all I could think of, and I think you probably came up with a similar conclusion, Martin, was that there's some predator there that's been taking the fish. Um, much more quickly than the fish are replacing themselves. Um, so I wondered if, I mean, I don't know, where, where did you say Tim lived? Do we, do we know where Tim lived? He doesn't, he doesn't say where he lived, but I did wonder whether a heron and my, maybe had got in there or something, but, but perhaps we, we're never going to know the solution to that one, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, um, it says, uh, this is Lee's pond, and it says, he says the, 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 the question is um, that we've had smooth, newts, toads, frogs, pond snails, ramsorns, all manner of flies, and we get small newts in the garden after clearing out the pond, but we've never had frogs spawn or toads spawn, even when we've had male or female females in the pond. And they're wondering if there is something wrong with the pond or why are they not getting any toads, stork spawns or frog spawns in the pond when it seemed like it should be suitable? Yeah. Um, pr probably because there are newts there uh, and they don't tend to co-inhabit very well. Um, I, it gave me the impression from what he said that it, it, the frogs didn't spawn. If they had spawned, then the newts could well eat the spawn. That's what I was thinking. Uh, but he hadn't seen any spawn. I mean, we, we know that frogs aren't really very fussy where they lay their eggs, because sometimes they'll just lay them in a puddle, won't they? Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. a bit of a mystery. But I think um, if you've got newts in the pond, then you're very much likely to have frogs. They don't tend to co-inhabit. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. I must say, we're, we're going to move on um, just so we can get a few more questions in. Um, we, we, I've seen frogs in our, our pond, but we've never had any frog spawn, so it's almost like they know that there, maybe there's newts in there, and so they don't always lay. So we've got the last, there's a last couple which I just want to um, draw your attention to, which is again is about this um, aeration. So we've had one on an email and one from this pond here. Um, the, uh, Alison asks, um, do you need a pump in the pond, or can you man measure it, manage it without? So can you aerate it without a pond? And John, whose pond you can see here, says um he says what what aquatic pond uh, what aquatic plants would you require and should you put in a fountain for aeration so a uh, question there about how do we get oxygen into the pond okay well the best way to get oxygen into the pond is by planting the right sorts of plants and the right number of plants now uh, there are some floating oxygenating plants and others that sit in the bottom um usually in sort of you plant them in a basket or a pot with holes in or something um, so that's the best way. You don't need a pump. Uh, if anything, I think it could possibly damage wildlife with it, you know, moving the water around and taking it through the mechanism. 
because yeah, there's some very, very small things in, in ponds, which are just as important as the bigger things, uh, creatures. Um, so no, you don't need to do that, but you do definitely need to have plenty of really good plants. And um, who was it? Somebody asked about a list of plants. Uh, Martin, you yeah, said- Yeah, John, John said, John, John was saying, what would you recommend in this pond for putting plants around or in? Yeah, well, there's a big, big long list, uh, which we have on our website. And I know that we're going to be sending out some links to, to the, this information. So I, I won't list them verbally, but there's, there'll definitely be some information coming out to you, John, as to what plants would be best in your pond. Yeah, and I just looking at, I was looking at John's pond and I was thinking, I don't know what you think, putting some around the edge maybe, he seems to be, have quite a lot of lawn here. What, what I did was mine, with mine was took the grass back a little bit and planted some along the edge to make a little bit of a covering around the edge here. And it looks like he's got opportunity to do that here as well. Yeah, I think um, you can't really stress enough, but uh, making a pond good for wildlife and getting a really diverse number of species going into it um, helps everything about the pond. It helps it be clean and oxygenated um, because the detritus is being eaten up and everything's being circulated. So that's that's what you need to do. So making it better around the edges would help that, wouldn't it? Because it would help creatures coming in and out. Yeah. And that's what you need to do. Okay, so we've got we've got we've got about five or so minutes left, and we've got quite a few questions on the questions and answers. So I'm just going to um, have a quick look at them, and maybe we can uh, we can we can answer some of those questions before we go. We've got uh, we've got Laura who's got a question. She says, "I have two cats, but we are hoping to build a small wildlife pond in our garden. How should I cat-proof the pond so that they don't attack the lovely biodiversity that we hope to attract? Have you ever had problems with cats, Jen?" Well, uh, I had a cat years ago that used to birds and mice and all sorts of things even bought a frog in once but uh, they don't like frogs they don't taste nice so you know they won't go for that sort of thing um but the frog survived because the cat didn't really like it, it just um so I, I don't know whether they're, they're that much of a threat really uh, they are a threat to um small mammals and birds but not so much to pond creatures uh, i think cats also dislike water so i don't think they'll be well unless you've got a very unusual cat i don't know um, so yeah, well, may, may, maybe if you've got fish in there, but possibly the, 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 the aquatic invertebrates and that level that we've been talking about is not so attractive to cats, is it? Yeah, no, um, fish are not, a, are not a great thing for a small pond um, either, uh, no. because they tend to eat everything else. So really, if you want good biodiversity and you've only got a small pond, don't go, don't go for fish, really. No. Okay, so we've got a question from Chris here. He said, uh, my tadpoles have developed neither legs nor arms. I have read that algae is needed. Have you come across? Oh. Where can I get yeah. Um, I've come across tadpoles that haven't developed. Um, and actually, I'm not even sure if I do know the answer to that question. Have you? Do you know the answer to that question, Martin? I know, but it's maybe, um, it's maybe quite early on, is it, for um, tadpoles to be developing like eggs and legs and arms? I mean, I would have thought... Hmm. Yes, it yes it is a bit early for that but it's just if this was an ongoing problem that he suffered you would think it might be something to do with nutrition really potentially um but it is early so i'm not quite sure the circumstances um I'm not sure okay uh, we've got another question here uh from stuart he says we are we are planning a large pond about eight meters square what's the best depth to make it um, well, varied. Um, I'd say at least four foot deep. Would you say that, Martin? Um, In the my, well, area? if you've got eight foot, is about eight meters square. It, it I vary the depth. I would say if you can, so have shallow bits and deep bits. Our deepest is in the video is like two meter, two two feet deep. It depends how much you want to dig, really. Yeah, I'd say four foot would be good for a big pond. Yeah, maybe even five. But yeah. Um, Varied, definitely varied. How strong, how strong your muscles are. Then uh, we've got another one from from Clive. It says, my pond is near a small copse which has grown tremendously well. This has resulted in great volumes of leaves falling into the pond. My question is, when can I clear these out without detrimental effect to the pond life? Yeah, yeah, you need to get them out as soon as they go in, really. Because uh, if they sit there rotting in the pond, that will be detrimental to the pond life. Um, because the nutrients will raise and the pond will go cloudy and all sorts of things go wrong with it. Um, so yes, yeah, scoop them out in the autumn. Um, pond maintenance work is best done outside of the amphibian breeding season. So 
from about sort of late summer, October to February, if you're going to do any major works such as clearing out leaves. Um, but I'd try and get the leaves out before they, you know, as they go in, um, as they're floating on the surface. Um, maybe even put something over the pond at that time, so that you don't act, they don't actually end up going in there at all. It depends how big it is, really. Your pond, put a net yeah. across it. Um, we've had a, we've had a, a reply from Tim actually getting onto the the pond. Remember Tim's pond with the fish that was that taken, and he said, yeah, there was a there was a heron around, but he says he wonder if it could carry off a, a huge carp. So perhaps it was a no. eagle. perhaps it was a golden eagle, Jan. What do you think? Ah, no, well, I my bet my money was on mink or on mink. otters. Yeah, but, you know, possibly. Um, does does Tim know whether he's got any any mink around there um, or or otters for that matter? No, I don't. We I can't speak to him, can we? But, uh, maybe, maybe Tim, you could put up a uh, like a webcam or a trail cam next to your pond and see if you can see any any night creatures going in there and and, and taking the fish out. So we've had a, we've had a question from Richard, and he said, "I work at a secondary school, and we're going to make a pond as soon as we can. Do you have a model pond we can base our pond on?" Now, I think we we will have that in our in our some of our fact sheets, will we, Jan? Yes, definitely. Um, but yes, <laughs> there's the answer to that. So we've got plenty of um, links to great, you know, great, great tips as to how to do it and profiles and that sort of thing, the way you dig it. But it sounds like a great thing to be doing in a school, have a pond. Brilliant. Um, okay, we've got a question here. Uh, Julie sent in, I asked, I asked a question about feeding tadpoles. I've been feeding them with, with worm and robin food. Do you, do you think we need to be feeding tadpoles? And if so, what, what do we feed them with? Well, you shouldn't really need to feed tadpoles because they should have everything they need in the pond. Having said that, I feed my garden birds and I, you know, you could say you shouldn't do that, but lots of people do because they like to see them there. So um, I don't think there's any harm in it. It's the right sort of food, as long as it's protein food and it isn't making the water um, dirty, you know, because they're not really eating it. They're just throwing it in. And, um, so I would say that sounds okay. Okay. Okay, um, and then I think we've got time for one last question or um, let me have a look at what we've got left there. Um, there's been questions about how we get wildlife into ponds. So, so a lady's been asking about how do we get newts into our ponds or frogs into our ponds? And I, I don't know what you think about um, how do we get wildlife in if, you, if we can't buy them? No, um, well, you wait for it to come to you is the, the, the right answer there. Um, often if you bring ponds, oh, sorry, plants in from other people's ponds or from garden centres and things, they'll have eggs on them and that's perhaps how snails might come in and that kind of thing. They might come in on the feet of herons or, you know, other birds that, that come into the pond. Um, and of course they fly in because they're insects. If you fill up a paddling pool full of water, you can sometimes you find somebody find you've got something in there, don't you? So uh, the things will come, newts will come if their habitat's right. Um, having the right habitat is the best way all around the pond, not just the pond itself, but the, the area surrounding it uh, and a habitat corridor for, for creatures to move through and that yeah. will attract them then, won't they? We, when, when we built our pond, we live on, a state, on an estate which is just surrounded by houses and within two or three months, newts had arrived at our pond and we were all thinking, where have they come from? They just appeared from, from nowhere. So. So I, I, I'm not sure there is any way you can get them to come to your, like you say, to your pond other than by just creating a nice habitat for them. Yes. Okay, so I think we maybe covered this before, but um, um, getting the green weed out of the pond, you were, you were saying just uh, try and lift it out, were you? We just, you can remove it quite safely, can you? The, the sort yeah. of foggy. Yes, um, if it's very bad now uh, and you want to try and remove it, remove it, which you could do, you must always put it very close to the edge of the pond so that anything that comes out with it can crawl back in. So don't chuck, throw it straight on the compost heap or anything like that and then move it once it's been there for at least 24 right. hours. Um, but you can physically remove it, but there are other ways of treating it too, as I said before. And, uh, and then one final question, what do you think about tap, uh, putting tap water into your pond? Should we, how should we... Okay. Well, um, it's not thought to be a good thing. It, it does actually increase the um, nutrition of the pond. Uh, it, it's, it's said, I mean, you think it wouldn't much, but it can make, it can cause that green, that green algae stuff. So it's better to have rainwater. If you can't do it with rainwater, 
then um, when you first fill, you first fill your pond, you just leave it standing there for, for a while and the chlorine will disappear from it eventually, won't it? But if you're topping it up, um, try and do it from either a rainwater source or something that's been standing in a barrel or something for a long time. Um, yeah. so did you, would you agree, Martin, on that one? Uh, yeah, we, we have a, I was going to say, we have a rainwater collector at the bottom of our drain pipe and that's been really helpful at filling up the pond if you can just connect that to your pond. Um, it's quite an easy way of filling it up. Yes, that's, that's good. Okay, well, um, our time's up, I'm afraid. Uh, we, I think, uh, hopefully, we've answered as many questions as we can. And apologies to those of you who either sent it in by email at, or sent it on the questions and answers that we've not had time. Um, I, I, we'll, we'll maybe try and get back to you if we can about that. But um, otherwise, um, it's, it's unfortunately our time's up. So. I hope that you've enjoyed what we've been able to share today. I hope you found it useful. I hope that some of the things we've shown you or we've talked to you about have inspired you to, to go and do more for wildlife in, in the garden. As I said at the start of this, this webinar is being recorded. So if there are things about it you, you, you heard us say, but you didn't write them down and you couldn't, you couldn't remember, then you can go back and listen to that. It'll be up on YouTube if you want to watch it again. And if you want to know more about uh, wildlife gardening, there are, there are things on our website. And if you gave us your email address, we will also be sending you um, some information like lists of aquatic plants that Jan was talking about or how to build a pond. Um, and so you can always go to those for more information. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, but before we go, we've got one last bit of excitement. Um, and we'd like you to fill in a, a, a small poll just to give us a bit of feedback as to whether this was a success, whether we should do it again, whether me and Jan have got a future in online webinars and whether we should get back to our day jobs. Um, so I've got a, a little poll coming up on the screen now and I hopefully as many of you can see it as possible. I know that not everybody does see it, but um, basically the question says on a scale of one to five, how much did you enjoy this webinar? And you just click on the number. Um, obviously you're going to be clicking five, mostly people I think, but um, no, you can click whatever you like. Um, it's completely anonymous um, just to see what people thought and, and, and whether this is a good idea because in the world of COVID-19, we may be, doing more of these sorts of webinars in the future and hopefully getting better at doing them. So just getting some kind of feedback would be really helpful. So I'll just give that um, another couple of seconds. And then what we'll do is the exciting bit is that we'll show you what those results are and you can see whether or not people agreed with um, the response that you gave. So I'll probably just end it there. Um, give you the last couple of seconds for the final people. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results so you can see what we all thought. So there we go. We can see that uh, thankfully most people thought it was a, thought it was good and they enjoyed it despite the the technological problems we were having at this end. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Certainly, me and Jan have enjoyed uh, preparing for this and being able to share something, even though we are in lockdown. Um, and uh, and that, that's about that, that. Just about concludes the webinar for today. So thank you for again for for tuning in, and hopefully there will be more of these in the future. So if you haven't, um, you haven't logged out of Zoom before, just click on the end meeting button at the bottom and hopefully we'll be able to see you in one of these again. So thanks again for joining. If you're not members, please do consider joining as a member. And if you are, thank you for your support. And good, goodbye from me and Jan. Goodbye. <laughs> that was the bit we had rehearsed really well. Yeah, yeah, just... Bye everyone, thanks for coming. Bye. <laughs>